today we learn about the moon, man and the moon. We hear a reading from Essie Durant talking to the moon and we make a chart so we can monitor the phases of the moon. Today's video is all about the celestial body we see in the sky at night, the moon. So what is the moon? Well, the moon is actually a dusty ball of rock. It's about 3,647 kilometres in diameter, which makes it a quarter of the size of the Earth. The moon actually has mountains and it has flat plains, which are called seas, though it has no water on it. And they're made of hardened lava. Many, many moons ago, if you'll excuse the pun, about three or four billion years ago, the uh, moon had volcanic activity and so the seas are made of hardened lava. So how did the moon come about? Well, scientists aren't exactly sure, but a popular theory is a Mars-sized rock called Thea crashed into the Earth about 4.5 billion years ago and some of the debris clumped together and helped create the moon. The moon's gravity is one sixth weaker than that of Earth, which means on the moon you would in fact weigh less and it has a very thin atmosphere so it can get really really hot but it can also get really really cold, there's nothing to shield it. The moon's gravitational pull on Earth creates the tides the sea goes in and out. And it also means that the Earth wobbles a bit on its axis. So we have a fairly stable climate. Life thrives very well on Earth and it's helped due to this property of the moon. Did you know there are 190 moons in our solar system? And the moon, our moon, is the fifth biggest of them all. The moon rotates on its own axis as well as rotating around our Earth. And the duration of both of these things is about 27 days. So because it takes roughly the same time, it means that we only ever see the same side of the moon. We've only really ever seen 60% of the moon, just over half, because as it turns and as it revolves around the Earth, it's the same bit of moon that we see. Part of the moon that faces us is called the near side and the other side is called the far side. Now, if you're wondering what the moon is made of, it's not cheese, I'm afraid. The moon is made out of iron. It has a solid inner core of iron and then a liquefied iron outer shell. The mantle goes from the sort of liquidy bit right up to the moon's crust. Um, which consists of iron, silicon, magnesium, calcium and other minerals. The moon is currently moving away from Earth. It's very sad indeed, but luckily only by 3.8 centimetres a year. Here's a little timeline of the history of man and the moon. Um, in 1610, the Italian astronomer Galileo made the first observation by telescope of the moon. In 1645, the first map of the moon was made. And then in 1753, Roger Joseph Boscovich proved that the moon had no atmosphere. Talk of sending rockets to the moon began in the 1920s. In 1959, a Russian spacecraft, Luna 2, actually reached the moon, impacting it, but there were no men on board. Throughout the 60s, there were a few trips to the moon, both by the Russians and the Americans, circling the moon, taking photos. But then in 1969, the first man landed on the moon. Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin spent about two hours, 45 minutes outside of their spacecraft on their visit to the moon and they left six US flags, a camera and some other bits and pieces. So if any Martians get to the moon, they'll see footprints there and tire tra tracks of the lunar module. The last manned flight to the moon was in 1972, but there is another one planned for 2024. The craters on the surface of the moon have been made over the years by meteorites that have crashed into it. And although the moon appears lit up to us in the sky at night, it has no light of its own. It's basically reflecting the light of the sun. And you may notice that the moon appears in different shapes on different nights. Through the month, the moon changes and that's called the phases of the moon. And it's due to the 
Earth's shadow being cast on the moon and what light manages to reflect off the moon. And we're going to look a bit at the phases of the moon after our book reading today. Talking to the Moon by S.E. Durant. Chapter 1. October. The Lost Girl. The Lost Girl looks like me, even though she's two and I'm nearly 11. She's got the same wavy hair and gappy teeth, and her hair could be red like mine, though it's hard to tell in a black and white photo. You just have to guess. My guess is it's red. The photo's bent at the edges as if it's been carried around in someone's pocket and the corners got turned over. The girl's wearing a short-sleeved dress with a white collar, and she's standing on the stones on Brighton Pier with the West Pier in the background, the pier that burnt down. She might be smiling, but she's also squinting as if she's got the sun in her eyes or maybe an eyelash. You can't really tell. All I know is on that day, whenever it was, she stood on the beach with a bucket at her feet and an ice cream in her hand, looking like me. There could be a seagull hovering out of sight waiting to dive bomb her ice cream, or she might have let the ice cream drip down her wrist because she never liked it in the first place. She just held it for the photo. Or it might have been the best ice cream she ever tasted. Mimi pulled her out of a box of old photos and propped her on the mantelpiece next to the bracelet. She called her the lost girl. Every now and then, if we leave the window open or if someone walks in the door, the photo flutters onto the carpet. On the back, it says coral. Bad things, good things. My name's Iris and my grandma's name is Mimi. And that's what I call her. The whole family does. I know some people think it's weird, but it's not weird for me or my mum or even the two-year-old twins. I've been staying with her for five weeks. If I could, I'd stay here forever. I would. I've got mum's old bedroom all to myself and there's no damp or black mould crawling across the walls like in my real bedroom. There's no water seeping in at the corners either and even though the room's full of Mimi stuff, I don't mind at all. Other good things are, there's a seagull living on the roof. I don't have to see my dad pull his hair out while he looks at the mould in my bedroom. And I don't have to hear my heart pound when the twins pull the radiator off the wall or think they can fly by jumping off the kitchen table. Yes, they've done them both. And I don't have to watch my mum run out of the door eating a slice of toast because she's late for work and spend the whole day worrying she might have choked on her way to the hospital. She's a doctor. And there'll be no one there to do the Heimlich manoeuvre. The Heimlich manoeuvre, in case you're wondering, is what you do when someone's choking. I learnt it after one of the twins tried to swallow a Christmas bauble. Even though Mimi's house is not far from mine, living here is the opposite of living at home. We eat when we feel like it. We talk when we feel like it. We listen to each other. We bake cakes. We make a mess. And we sit on the sofa and look at her millions of photos from when she was a photographer. It's a 10 minute walk to the beach. These are the good things. The not so good things are the shower's cold. I don't always get breakfast. Things go missing. But that's mostly it. More good than bad. Mimi's seagull. Our seagull always calls 12 times. Kia, 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 Kia then takes a breath. I'm calling our seagull her because you can't really tell with seagulls. Not unless they lay an egg and there's no egg. Not this year anyway. She's my new non-human friend. I communicate with our seagull telepathically. I'm pretty sure she understands. I think she's trying to tell me my life will be perfect when I'm 12. I've been trying to work out if other seagulls call the same number of times but I've noticed they don't. Our seagull's special. The seagull on Lee and Danny's roof over the road calls eight times, ten times, or sixteen times, all even numbers. That might mean something. I've no idea. Then again, it might not even be the same seagull. I only know ours. And if you're wondering how I know ours, all I can tell you is that it's something to do with the way she tilts her head and the look in her eyes. The seagulls on the beach cry any number of times. The most I've heard is 138 times from two seagulls circling a family eating chips. Yes, really. It's probably a record. Bungee jump. I'm sitting on the step in Mimi's little back garden, watching the seagull watching me from the top of the shed, when a voice says, Have you ever done a bungee jump? A boy's peering over the top of the hedge. 
Have you? Have you? He says. I shake my head. I'm going to do one when I'm old enough, he says. It's going to be one of my challenges. I look away, but he carries on. I thought it was just an old woman lived here, he says. I grip my teeth. If I don't speak to him, maybe he'll stop talking. He doesn't. I thought it was just a crazy old woman who talks to the moon. She's not crazy, I say. And she's not just an old woman. She's my grandma, if you want to know. And she's called Mimi. And I live here too. OK, he says. I'm coming through. He drops out of sight. And a stick, followed by two hands, pushes through a gap in the bottom of the hedge. Then comes curly black hair with leaves caught in it and a pair of glasses falling off a nose. And behind them, a face all screwed up and concentrating. He stands up and shakes himself down. We're in the same class, he says. You and me. I'm Mason. I know he's Mason. He's the boy who started my school two weeks ago. He throws paper aeroplanes across the room when Miss Sharma's not looking. Who tells jokes no one laughs at and walks out of school alone. And now he's my neighbour. Mason. Mason stays forever, poking at things with his stick, talking about his mum and her driving lessons and his hobby collecting marbles in his new room. The seagull gets bored and flies up onto the chimney. If I could fly up there myself, I would. Eventually, I say, I'm going in now. Just like that. Quite rude, really. I watch out of the kitchen window as Mason waits for a few minutes, then crawls back through the hedge. As soon as he's gone, the seagull flies back down to the shed and screeches 12 times. Here's what I learned about Mason. He's just moved next door with his mum, who works as an accountant for a big company, which means she's always, always, always in the office or working at home, Mason's words. And his mum's brilliant with numbers, Mason's words. He says you can give her any numbers and she can add them up or divide them or multiply them all in her head. He's pretty impressed with his mum. His bedroom is next to mine. They both look onto the little back gardens and we have the same flat roof outside our rooms. He says if we want, we can meet on the flat roof sometimes. I don't want. He can't stay still, even for one moment. He goes to the flea market every week to look for marbles. His granddad gave him his first one. His granddad's very old now. Mason says he's losing his marbles. He thought this was really funny and explained he didn't mean real marbles. I think I'd already worked that out. He wants us to walk to school together and to go to the market together and do lots of things together. I don't want to do anything with him. He thinks Mimi's garden and his garden is just one garden with a hedge down the middle. That means he thinks it's his. Me and the seagull. Have you made a new friend, says Mimi. No. Oh, that's a shame, she says. Just, I saw you talking to that boy. I shrug. Not wanting to be rude, she says, but you could do with a friend. That is rude, I say. And anyway, you're my friend, you and the seagull. She wraps her arms around me. She smells of her special purple soap. That's very sweet, she says. But wouldn't you like a friend your own age and species, she says, laughing. Ha ha, I say, not really. Well, aren't we lucky then, she says, me and the seagull. And she digs her fingers into my ribs and tickles me. So even though I'm annoyed, I can't be annoyed for long. Interesting things about Mimi. My dad calls Mimi a live wire. My mum rolls her eyes when he says this because Mimi's her mum. And maybe it was no fun growing up with a live wire. Because a live wire is full of electricity and jumps around all over the place. And if you're not careful, it can give you an awful shock. Dad doesn't mind though. He's an electrician when he's not looking after the twins. He knows how to handle it. And I don't mind either. It makes life interesting. Anyway, things about Mimi. Small, very thin, gappy teeth like me and coral. Long white hair. It used to be brown. Me and mum got the red hair. Patterned scarf in her hair or round her shoulders. Wears earrings, sometimes dangly ones, sometimes shiny studs. Likes bright dresses with patterns. Wears yellow sandals in summer and red ankle boots in winter and pink slippers in the house. Messy. Mum says very messy. Mimi has stuff everywhere and she likes it. I like it too, actually. Puts ribbons on things, kitchen drawers, baskets, her apron, her swimming costume, her finger. Moves like a bird. Fast. Like she might be about to take off. If she had wings, I don't think she'd ever come down from the sky. Every now and then she does a little dance. In the kitchen, in the living room, in the street. Yes, it's embarrassing. Her face usually goes up. Smile. 
eyebrows. But when it goes down, it goes down a very long way. She looks about 100 years old. Loves to swim in the sea. She's done it since she was a little girl. A bit forgetful. Likes to laugh. Her most precious thing is the bracelet she keeps on the mantelpiece. Her dad made it for her before he was killed in the war. He sent it home to Brighton when Mimi was four years old. Mimi says it's worth nothing and everything all at the same time. It's got five red wooden beads, three metal beads and a small green metal whistle. And they're threaded onto a bit of string with a knot you can tighten. Oh, another thing about Mimi is she wants to sort all her photos before she dies. I said, you're not going to die soon, are you? And she said, not if I can help it. Talking to the Moon there by S.E. Durant. Now, remember I said to you before, the Moon has many different phases and we actually only ever get to see one side of the Moon when we view it from Earth. The Moon takes more or less the same amount of time to go around the Earth as it does to rotate on its own axis. So you can see from the demonstration on the left that we get to see only one side of the moon, that dark side. Whereas on the right, the moon that's not rotating, we get to see all sides of it. Phases of the moon are determined by how much sun is shining on the near side, which is the side that we get to see. So when the moon is directly between Earth and the sun, then we see a dark full moon because the sun is shining on the back side of the moon, which is the far side. Whereas if the Earth is between the moon and the sun, that means the near side has the full glow of the sun on it. And so we see a full moon. And in between the full moon and no moon, we get to see different shapes of moon, depending on how much sun is shining on the near side. And a really easy way to demonstrate this is by making a chart like this you need to get some paper or some card. I found a bit of black card off some packaging, which is what I'm going to use, but any paper or card will be fine. So that's going to be uh, my backdrop. So it's black and spacey, um, but you could use any color you want. And then you need to get some circles to draw your phases of the moon. So I reckon a bottle lid will be fine for me because I need to fit eight onto my uh, phase calculator. And then I'll put a bigger circle in the middle for the earth and at the side is where our sun will go. So I'm now cutting out eight little circles from paper to be my moon phases. But there you can see I've popped my eight circles down onto my card. You need one at the top and the bottom and then two left and right and then the other four can go in between. Then on the right side I've got a space where I'm going to put my sun and the earth is going to go in the middle. So here you can see I've cut out a slightly bigger circle which will go in the middle for Earth. Now you just need to uh, cut out the edge of the sun. So I've got a bit of yellow card here. So I've glued everything down now and I'm ready to draw my moon phases on. So now it gets more obvious. When the sun is here and we're here on Earth, we can only see this side of the moon which doesn't have the sun shining on it. So the moon between Earth and the sun will be a new moon. So you can see I've labelled all the phases of the moon. So you start with the new moon, which is obviously dark, like I said before, because the sun is only shining on the back side of the moon that we don't see from Earth. And then we move around into the first quarter where we get a crescent moon, then a half, then a three quarters, that one's called a waxing gibbous. Then we get a full moon, then another three quarters, which is a waning gibbous, a half moon in the third quarter, and then a waning crescent like that. And then we go back to a new moon. We rotate this way around the earth. Now I'm just gonna draw my earth in and then my little chart will be finished and I'll always be able to tell 
what moon is in the sky. There we have it, I can stick that by my bed and when I look at the moon at night, I'll know what phase it's in. Every month it starts off as a thin crescent, then goes right up to a full moon and then shrinks back down to a thin crescent and the whole cycle repeats monthly. The shape of the moon that you see depends on how much of the sun's light is reflecting off it as it rotates around the earth in its monthly cycle. Well, I hope you've enjoyed learning about the moon and hearing a bit of the fantastic story. Um, I will see you next time. Please subscribe and spread the word. Bye.